Hey, welcome back. You made it to video two of module one, so congratulations. Now that you've made it this far, let's keep rolling and get the momentum started to carry you through the rest of the course. Poker players from all walks of life will be taking this course. We've had everyone from nosebleed and super high rollers to low stakes grinders looking for their first breakthrough and everyone in between. Yet everyone who enrolls in this training has one thing in common. They all want something more. What that means varies person to person. But if you were completely comfortable and content with where you are right now, you wouldn't be here watching. And that begs the question, what's holding you back? Is that a question you've asked yourself before? If not, then it's a very important one. Because we know there's something. Because in addition to knowing that you're here because you want something more, we also know you're here to get help with whatever is holding you back. If you're already on the perfect path to achieving everything you desired, then you'd be out there following that, rather than searching for the answers here. Now please don't take that as a negative. In fact, it's actually the exact opposite. I've worked with a lot of incredibly successful people in poker, business and athletics, and I've yet to meet anyone who didn't have something that was holding them back from becoming the best version of themselves. In fact, the awareness of these roadblocks and the drive to consistently improve is what makes them so successful. So before we go any further, I want you to acknowledge three things. Number one, that you want something more from poker and life. Number two, that there are roadblocks currently holding you back from getting there. Number three, that you embrace these truths and see that those roadblocks are opportunities to improve rather than negative character traits. Hopefully once you do that, you'll notice an instant mindset shift where you go from struggling to acknowledge what's holding you back to seeing them as an exciting challenge for you to tackle each day. And with that, we can get started on identifying and eliminating these obstacles. So if you're not achieving the success you want in poker, or any area of your life, it boils down to three simple reasons. Number one, you don't know what to do to get there. Number two, you know what to do but can't. And number three, you know what to do but won't. When you break these three reasons down, they become what I call four performance roadblocks. If you took a random person off the street and asked them what it takes to become a successful poker player, you'd get some hilarious answers. But likely nobody would be able to give you an answer of any real value. They certainly wouldn't be able to give you an actionable step-by-step -step plan that you could implement over the next six months, year or two years to achieve that goal. In fact, they probably couldn't even come close to painting a picture of what a successful player does on a regular basis. Their lack of understanding of the game means they have no vision of a successful poker player. Not knowing where you're going makes it incredibly difficult to achieve anything. Without a plan, a map or a path, it's nearly impossible to make any meaningful progress. Before you can achieve success, you need to have at least a rough idea of what success looks like and an idea of how to get there. This means that lack of vision is performance roadblock number one. After we know what to do, meaning we have a vision and a plan, we need to actually do it. The second reason for lack of success I mentioned was know what but can't. This happens for two main reasons. Either you don't have the ability to take necessary actions or you don't have the energy needed to take them. Let's take that same random person we pulled off the streets earlier, put them in a room with Fedor Holtz and have him explain everything he did to become one of the best in the world and everything he does to maintain that status. That would be a great start. Comparing what you do to the best in the world is a great place to start when it comes to vision. But that random person wouldn't walk out of that room a successful poker player they would still need to acquire the necessary skills to follow through with that plan. That makes lack of skill performance roadblock number two. Now let's jump a year in the future and Fedor took that random person under his wing 
trained them every day, and now we have a new mini Fedor 2.0 with a crystal clear vision and plenty of skill. Now keep that player up for three days straight with no food and put them in a game, would they be able to perform? No, certainly not. They know what to do, but can't, because they lack the energy to perform. Obviously, it's an extreme example, but I'm sure you can relate to this one. Poor focus, burnout, C-game play are all connected with energy. That makes lack of energy performance roadblock number three. Now this is where things get interesting. The final reason I gave you was know what to do but won't. You have the vision, you have the skill, you have the energy, but you won't perform. You might be saying, hey Elliot, if I know exactly what I need to do, I have the skill to do it, and the energy I need to execute it, why in the world would I choose not to? That's certainly a good question, and logically speaking, it's not something that should happen. Yet it does all the time. Ever make a play at the table you specifically knew was wrong? Ever fail to take a risk that you knew was correct out of fear of failing and looking silly? Logically, when we know what to do, we should do it, but humans are far from purely logical creatures. If we were, I would be out of a job and this course wouldn't exist. I've seen studies where 70% or more of patients coming off a major cardiovascular disease episode fail to comply with the recommendations of their doctor. It doesn't get any more illogical than someone failing to follow through on a situation where they're told to change or die, but it happens all the time. Why is this? Well, it's the fourth performance roadblock, which I call detrimental mental programming. We shouldn't start slamming our chips in the middle out of frustration when we get a bad beat, but it happens all the time. We shouldn't start to self-sabotage when things finally start to go well, but it happens all the time. We shouldn't take lots of actions that feel good in the moment, but don't serve our long-term goals. But we do. And it's because when we come across a decision that conflicts with what we consciously know we should do, and what our mental program wants us to do, the programming usually wins. So there you have it, the four performance roadblocks. Once again, their lack of vision, lack of skill, lack of energy, and detrimental mental programs. Now we all know the possible roadblocks that are holding you back from achieving the poker success that you desire. The question is, where do we start? This is actually a vitally important question. Getting the order right makes all the difference in the world. The self-improvement market is over a $10 billion a year industry. And the truth is that most people who try to apply it see no change at all. And while there's plenty of bad information out there, that's not the reason why most people fall short. The problem comes when people apply good information in the wrong order. Think about building a house. You can get the best contractors in the world to build an immaculate interior with marble countertops, beautiful teak hardwood floors and the highest quality finishing. But if that house is built on unsteady ground with no foundation, it will quickly fall apart. The same is true when trying to improve your performance. You can try to apply all the latest and greatest strategies and tactics, all of the best information out there, but if you don't have the right foundation, none of it will stick. And the truth is it's even harder than that. When we have these detrimental mental programs running in the background, they might actually be actively fighting against the changes that we're trying to make. So not only do we build this beautiful house with no foundation, we place it right on top of an active earthquake fault line that's set to go off. That's why over $10 billion a year is spent by people who really do want to improve, but end up getting very little results. And the sad part is the industry keeps growing year on year as those who are incredibly hungry to change continue to search for answers. I believe the reason that so many of my private clients have had such success is because the first thing we do is address these detrimental mental programs. In fact, when I first got started working in the performance coaching industry, that was pretty much my sole focus. As a hypnotherapist, I work with my clients subconscious to identify these mental programs 
and then change them into something that moves them forward rather than holds them back. Once those major performance roadblocks are lifted, we start to build that house on its solid foundation and effectively apply all the other A-game strategies and tactics that you'll discover as you go through this training. Now the question is, where do these detrimental mental programs come from and why do they exist in the first place? We need to start off with a discussion on the conscious versus subconscious mind. The conscious mind is part of our mind we're actively aware of. The subconscious or unconscious mind is the operating system that runs everything else in the background. The amount of information and functions we need to run simultaneously is massive, and we'd absolutely freeze up if we had to consciously think about every little decision we needed to make. Just think about the simple act of standing up from a chair. You don't consciously think, all right body, place my right big toe on the floor, followed by the rest of my foot, followed by my heel, oh and lungs keep breathing and heart keep pumping, now activate the lower kinetic chain and use your right arm for balance and stand up. Even though the actual complexity of the action is much greater than my rough example, you just think stand up and the subconscious handles the rest. Throw in all other physical activities, environmental awareness, predictive analysis, and social interaction, you start to see the complexity that we're dealing with here. This brings me to my first major point. The subconscious mind is here to help. It's there to help you function. It's there to help you survive, and it's here to protect you. This is an important fact to remember because it's not always obvious. Your conscious and subconscious mind are both on Team You. They just don't always agree on what's best for you. Without your subconscious mental programs, you simply wouldn't be able to function. A mental program becomes detrimental when the situation that the program was designed to protect you from no longer exists, or was based on a false premise or signal in the first place, or when your subconscious mistakenly categorized something as dangerous when it really is not. Most of our programming was created when we were children, we come into this world, we have a long way to go before we can function, even on the most basic level in society. We learn the majority of what we need to know through observation, modelling, trial and error. Young minds are like a sponge that can soak up and learn all of the complexities that go along with being human. We need to learn everything from using our bodies, using our minds and interacting with other people. And all of that information is stored as these mental programmes in our subconscious. There is no book we can pick up that tells us the best way to be human. We absorb that information from our environment. We learn what's, quote, good and bad, or right and wrong, dangerous and safe. Now here's the thing. We don't always get the correct and most beneficial data from our environment. Sometimes we create programs in order to protect us from our parents. Sometimes it's protect us from other authority figures, such as family members, teachers, or other prominent adults in our life. Sometimes it's to protect us from our peers. A child is completely dependent on their parents, so it's a simple survival mechanism to create mental programs that are in line with what the parents believe and how they act. Once a child hits school age, teachers and peers also become a major influence, so we create mental programs designed to help us survive and manage those environments. Obviously, the word protect and survive are heavy terms, but that's literally how the subconscious mind sees it. The world used to be a much harsher place, and I don't think the evolution of the subconscious has quite caught up to understand that. That means it's quite common for our subconscious to create programs that don't actually serve to improve our lives, and instances, confrontations and encounters that might seem small on the outside can have a ripple effect that lasts a lifetime. This is obviously a subject where the science is always evolving, and we're still many, many years away from fully understanding how the mind works, if we ever do at all. However, this should give you a fundamental understanding of the basics and allow you to start to understand where your mental programs come from and why they don't always serve the purpose of protecting you like they're supposed to. Now let's take a look at some examples of detrimental mental programs and how they can cause issues for a poker player. A simple example would be a program that said, poker is a game of pure luck. If you had this mental program running, you wouldn't even attempt to become a serious poker player. So obviously this would be a huge roadblock to poker performance. 
You might play the game for fun, just like someone would play a slot machine. But the idea of putting in work into your game would never cross your mind. Now obviously this isn't the case for anyone watching this training, but it's not an all or nothing proposition. Many of you will have friends and family who constantly tell you that poker is all luck, and even if you consciously know otherwise, it can start to seep into your subconscious. Mix that with an extended downswing and could find yourself avoiding putting in any meaningful work because it's all luck anyways. Another detrimental mental program I often see is one that says, money is bad and so are people that have it. Imagine you put in a ton of work and finally start earning an amount that puts your head and shoulders above what you're used to seeing in your life. If you grew up in a family without a lot of money, and your parents consistently told you how money was the root of all evil and that rich people were bad guys, what happens now? Well, for many players, this is where self-sabotage comes in. Think of it like an internal money thermostat. You have an amount of money that you feel is acceptable to earn, so you put in the work to reach there. But once you're making more than that, you always seem to find a way to bring it back down to your comfort zone. This one is quite common and can be a massive roadblock to poker success. I'm just not a math person. If you had parents or teachers who often said things like, we aren't good at math in our family, or it's okay, you're not a math person, then that can become embedded as a mental program that's run every time you come upon a difficult math problem, rather than the logical approach of, this is a difficult math problem, let me try and figure it out you immediately default to, I'm not a math person and give up without trying. An idea that probably has little grounds in reality quickly becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy based on your programming. Obviously, understanding the math side of the game is quite important to succeed these days, so if you brush it off completely, you diminish your chances of success greatly. Here's an interesting one. Too smart to try. This is a program that has high prevalence in the poker world, as the game is very attractive to those who fit this mould. This program starts with someone who has above average intelligence and is told so by those around them. Seems perfectly harmless on the surface, but the problem comes when that intelligence is not challenged, which is incredibly common in the school system. Assignments, grades and test scores come easy, and they're never forced to put in extra work or struggle to find a solution. That's when this Too Smart to Try program gets installed, much of their self-worth is wrapped up in the idea that they're naturally intelligent, so when they run into a situation that doesn't come easily, they tend to avoid it. This is one way that fear of failure manifests itself. Someone with this program might find poker and love it, and also find they're able to have lots of success early and they learn the basics quickly. They might even be able to make it into professional ranks before they run into a wall. This was especially true in the early days of online poker, However, once their skills are stretched to their natural limits, they'll feel resistance to working on their game because they're supposed to be too smart to try. Well, that's our four examples, and I could talk all day about different ways these detrimental mental programs show up, but I think you're getting the idea now. So now we have a good idea about what these detrimental mental programs are and where they come from, the question is, what do we do about them? And that certainly is the million dollar question, and I've devoted a large part of my career to come up with good answers. Remember, you can learn all of the amazing self-help and high-performance principles, strategies and tactics, but if you do not address your programming, it will always be an uphill battle. That means the first step to unlocking your full potential and becoming the best version of yourself is to address the detrimental mental programs holding you back. I found there are three ways to do this. Mechanically, by installing habits, systems, and constraints that move the decision-making process externally, thus bypassing your programming. Logically, this is using your conscious mind to choose to act differently than your programming. When you hear people talk about grit, willpower, and hustle, this is the area they're talking about. And then we have subconsciously. This is where we bypass the conscious mind and start to work with the programs directly. Strategies in this area are self-talk, visualisation and hypnotherapy. I'll talk about each of these in more depth, but it's important to know that to have the most success, you need to address the detrimental mental programmes from all three directions. You need to attack these problems from all angles, rather than a one-dimensional attack that's easily sidestepped. First up, we have mechanically. 
This is where we use habits, systems, and constraints to shift the decision-making process externally so that we bypass the program altogether. The theory is if you bypass the programs long enough, you'll start to write a new mental program that's actually positive and will replace the old detrimental ones. This is actually a highly effective way of addressing detrimental negative programs. In fact, a large portion of this course is about installing the best habits, systems and constraints that have worked for my high-performing poker clients and install them in your game. Here's a quick example. Let's say you have a mental program that compels you to overeat when you feel stress and your go-to is a big bag of potato chips. A mechanical way to deal with this problem would be to never keep a big bag of potato chips in the house. This means when your eat a bag of potato chips to feel better program runs and you're at home, there's no bag of chips present because you applied an external constraint earlier. Your environment plays a major role in how you behave, so controlling your environment allows you to control your mental programs, at least to a certain extent. The drawback is, obviously the program is still there, and while it's possible to slowly rewrite it over time, the key word here is slowly. People will often have a lot of success using purely mechanical strategies, only to miss the mark once and then fall back into their programming. That being said, these habits, systems and constraints are some of the best methods out there for making changes and improving performance, especially when used in conjunction with the other two areas we'll cover next. The second way we address detrimental negative programs is logically. This means when a program runs that's against our best interest, we consciously tell it no. This is the area that most people operate in, and sadly the most difficult and least effective when you try to use it on its own. Just think about it for a second. If everyone had the ability to always act in a way that was logically in their best interest, in a way that was completely in alignment with how they wanted things to be, you wouldn't be here and I would be out of a job. Logical strategies include things like willpower, grit and hustle. While these are all admirable qualities, and ones you should certainly work on to stretch them to their full capacity, they do have their limits. It would be nice if we lived in a world where success and performance simply came down to how hard you try, but that's not how it works. The truth is, when a conscious desire and a mental program conflict, the mental program almost always wins. And this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. If we had to consciously make every decision we needed to, it would simply take too much processing power for us to handle. The good news is, when you accept this to be true, it means you can start to remove some of the negative labels you may have had for yourself, such as lazy, slacker or underperformer. And with that I give you an example of how logic can be used to address a detrimental mental program. The lesson here is that any logical solution on its own will have limits, which is why advice like try harder, toughen up and hustle more simply doesn't work for most people. Now here's the interesting part. While it's not very effective on its own, logic and conscious decisions are absolutely necessary to the process of change. Change is a choice, and choice is a conscious decision. None of the strategies I teach whether mechanically, logically, or subconscious, will ever work unless you actually consciously want them to. This is what I mean when I say to effectively address detrimental mental programs, you must attack from all three angles. In the end, performance is a choice, and all the other strategies we use are designed to make it possible for you to make that choice when the time comes. Think of it as the logical strategies riding on the backs of the mechanical and subconscious ones, in order to be delivered to the source. It's sort of like a capsule of a pill designed to stay intact in the stomach just long enough for the medicine to be delivered to the right place. The third way we can address detrimental mental programs is subconsciously. This is where we bypass the conscious mind and begin to work with mental programs where they live. In my opinion, this is the missing link in all of the self-help and performance material that sounds good on the surface but doesn't actually work for most people in practice. As we've discussed so far, the mechanical strategies bypass the underlying issue and affect permanent change slowly, and logical strategies have severe limits. So while they're important pieces to the puzzle, without this last piece, they're just incomplete. Subconscious strategies include regulating self-talk, visualization, self-hypnosis, and hypnotherapy. 
Where the first two strategies work by bypassing and ignoring the detrimental mental programs, the subconscious strategies address them directly. And that's the reason I believe my poker clients have had such success. It's because of the subconscious strategies I employ. In fact, when I first got started, hypnotherapy, the most powerful subconscious strategy, was all I offered to my clients. At the time, I knew little about the game, but my clients still saw rapid results as they were able to quickly and effectively address the detrimental mental programs holding them back. Over the years, I've developed a full range of strategies that incorporate all three areas, and results have continued to get better and better. In fact, the course you're on now is my way of taking that knowledge out of my head and turning it into something tangible. Anyways, back to the subject of subconscious. As we discussed earlier, our detrimental mental programs are part of our subconscious. The best way to address them in the moment is to talk to them directly. We can do this in two ways, with self-talk and visualisation. Self-talk is quite literally talking to ourselves. Repeating negative thoughts over and over again can create a detrimental negative program, just as talking to yourself positively can overwrite a negative one. The final video of this week discusses that in greater detail, so you'll learn more about the subject there. The other way to work with the subconscious is through visualisation. A simple visualisation would be seeing an image in your mind, or playing out a quick movie of something that could happen. With self-hypnosis, you're using techniques to strategically go a bit deeper, where visualisation can be even more effective. With hypnotherapy, a qualified practitioner guides you through the process and allows you to go even deeper and further. Once you bypass the conscious mind, you become more open to suggestion, which is where we can start to inject the logic and remove or rewrite the programs into something that benefits you. The earlier example I gave of Money is a bad mental program that led to self-sabotage once you started to achieve a certain level of success. If a client came to me with that program, I would work with them to discover when the program was first installed and use the visualisation to insert the logic that obviously money isn't inherently bad and they'd simply been given bad advice by people who didn't know any better. Another example would be my Mindset MP3s or Prime Mind app in those, we're using guided hypnosis audios to put you in a state of deep relaxation and begin to work with the subconscious to achieve a specific outcome, whether that's getting in the zone before a session, working through a specific leak like calling when you know you shouldn't, or something like stopping overeating or quit smoking. That's a very quick rundown of how these subconscious strategies work. We've covered a ton so far in this video, starting with the four performance roadblocks, from there, we decided that the first step must be addressing your detrimental mental programs, and I showed you what those programs are and how they're formed. We then covered the three angles that we can attack them from, mechanically, logically, and subconsciously. And now you understand that using strategies from all three areas is key to making real progress in addressing your programming. Simply having the knowledge you do now will put you light years ahead of your competition, who have no idea why they aren't able to achieve the performance they desire. But let's not stop there. In the next video, we're going to go through an exercise I call Brave, which is designed to address some of the resistances holding you back from being the best poker player you can be, resistances caused by detrimental mental programming. Before we do that, it's time to complete a quick exercise for this section. I want you to think of three areas of the game that you know you could be better in, but have resistance to doing. Something you know the best players in the world are doing that either you aren't doing consistently or not at all. When we stop to think about it, most people have a pretty good idea of a few areas where they have resistance, and we'll start our journey addressing these areas. If you happen to struggle to list three things, go and check out a few of the Inside of the Mind of interviews, where many of the best players in the world have laid out their approach to success. You'll certainly be able to find those areas after doing that if you don't already know them straight away. Once you do that, you're free to move on to the next video. I'll see you there.